Hello everyone and welcome to Jim Dalton's presentation on Gaining an Edge, Recognizing and Leveraging Nuances. It's Tuesday, September 16th, currently 4.30 Eastern. We'll go for about an hour or whenever we seem to get everything covered. And uh, Jim and I want to thank you all for being here. We have a pretty full house and it's great to see you all. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and I will moderate the um, questions. My name is Julia Stewart. I am a partner here at J. Dalton Trading with Mr. Dalton and I too am a student. So my charge is to share Jim's work with fellow traders and the trading community. So I will moderate today and answer as many questions as we can get in. So please type them in. Okay and thanks again everyone and if I may I will introduce the master, Mr. Jim Dalton. Well thank you. Thank you. All right. The, um, today we're talking about nuances. You never become a pro until you get into the topic of nuances. Understanding the basic market, how the basic market functions, is, is the groundwork. When you really start to get experience, it's the nuances that make a difference. And we're going to talk a lot about nuances today. We've got an important one that happened yesterday. We are going to see two nuances in action today. Uh, so I think there's a lot of information coming forward. Okay, advance the slide. Okay, some examples of nuances. Rally highs and pullback lows. These generally uh, pertain to trend days. On a trend day, the market trends up, and then you get the rally of the, uh, the pullback low sometime in the afternoon. That becomes the uh, the pullback low and it's a reference going forward. Uh, if the following day you don't trade back down below that pullback low, then nothing has changed relative to the previous day. Okay, poor highs and lows, what do they represent? A poor high and, and poor low represent several things. One, they represent an auction that really is not completed. A lot of times you'll have a poor high or a poor low Let's say in this case we're going to be talking about poor highs today. The poor high and then the market sells off from there. What is so significant from that is that the odds say that that sell off is nothing more than liquidation versus something that is more potent, which would be a combination of new money selling and liquidation. Normally if you have new money selling, you're going to, it's going to be a more aggressive at the high, you'll have some single prints, and it will elongate more. Overnight inventory, We're, we, uh, we talk about overnight inventory quite a bit. Um, we know that uh, it's not an official survey, but an unofficial survey, the track we keep of it, about 65% of the days uh, you'll see a counter to overnight inventory early in the morning. We're going to see a little later. That's exactly what happened this morning. Overnight inventory was about 95% short coming into this morning, and the market immediately started to trade up. Um, combined with some of these nuances, we will see uh, uh, setups when we, uh, say for example, enter uh, re-enter a prior range. Um, I'm not sure that's as much as a nuance as it is something we'll discuss in a little more detail when we look at yesterday. Gamesmanship. Trading is a game. Um, and a lot of times, if you're not aware of this, it can be to your detriment. We're going to see an example where yesterday afternoon the market came up and that game was in full, in full swing. But we'll show that to you step by step. Half back is a nuance. It's just simply early in the morning. Uh, half back the first period or half back uh, um, for the overall day later on becomes a very significant short-term reference. As you'll see today, the pullback low this morning was to one tick above half back before the market rallied to um, the highs that we saw later this afternoon. Anomalies. Uh, anomalies are uneven portions on the profile and they usually occur when there's forcing action going on such as short covering or long liquidation. Anomalies are a sign that there's a high emotion in the, in the market and you're not getting a lot of symmetries. A lot of times 
those anomalies are retraced. We will see those, we will see examples of those anomalies when we go and look at today's profile. Very evident, and we'll talk later about what that mean, may mean for tomorrow. And of course, the last item we have on here, it's really not a nuance, it's the base, it's the basis of everything we do. Um, I'm reading a book right now called um, uh, One Good Trade, and what it hit me, one, we have one good idea. We have a lot of nuances around that idea, but really the idea of trading value versus price is the biggest idea we have. And once again, we will see that in play when we go and review what happened yesterday. All right, let's, let's go and take a look at a rally high from last Friday, and let's start our presentation of nuances from there. Friday after Friday, the market was breaking. Late in the afternoon, you saw the market rally. You saw a J period high. You saw L match that perfectly, M and N. So that's the, and you see what, it, this is what it looks like on a opened up profile, spread out. Here's what it looks like on a collapsed profile. So this was the high the market went that afternoon you can rest assured that there are going to be stops just above those just above that level because it represents the high of four separate time periods in the afternoon that is not an impressive high what was happening when you get highs like that even though that's not on the daily high or low it's kind of an inner day high when it takes place to an exact price like that that tells you that the people selling at that level are more than likely shorter term traders. And at shorter term versus longer term, more serious traders that have staying power. We do a lot to talk about, when we, we've got an intensive coming up here, starts the end of this month. The whole time throughout the intensive, we are trying to help you understand markets based upon the behavior of those you are competing against. And it's very important. The behavior of the longer term time frames are far different than the day and short term time frames. When I see these multiple highs up here, I know that it's either day or short term time frames. I know that the day or short term time frames are far more fickle in uh, in their willingness to hold a position, they're far quicker to reverse positions and far quicker to become very emotionally involved. The longer term money tends to be um, a, a little bit uh, uh, longer term. Uh, they don't enter and exit the market with the same amount of emotion. That doesn't mean always. There are times when everybody goes through that same thing. But overall, um, they're much calmer. Uh, they're more selective about what they do. Day and shorter term traders, far more emotional, and they tend to get in more trouble, and they tend to also get inventories that become too long or too short. So much of trading, particularly the shorter term trading you do, the more important it is to understand the inventory conditions of those you are competing against. So we start off Here's the, um, the rally high um, and the afternoon. Here is on Friday afternoon, and here's where the, um, where the market closed. So before we go to the next slide, you can rest assured there's going to be stops up above this. If I can figure, out, figure it out, remember, very likely that many traders can do exactly the same thing. The next slide shows overnight inventory. You will see the overnight trading, the high on Sunday night, was just one single tick above the pullback or the rally high on Friday afternoon. So if we already had stops here, when that also now becomes basically the overnight high, what do you think's happened to stocks now? Stops now, have they increased or have they decreased? Going to the next slide, this is the opening 
yesterday yesterday morning. As you'll see, yesterday morning the market opened. It went one tick higher. That tick was exactly at the rally high from Friday afternoon, and then the market began to sell off. So one more time, if we had stops there on Friday, we know we picked up more when it was the overnight high, and you can pretty well assure yourself that we picked up even more stops once it became yesterday morning's high. Now that is an extremely important piece of information to carry forward with you. And sometimes it's hard to do that because all of a sudden the market takes off to the downside and it starts to trade aggressively lower. What have I done? Hold on. Okay. So it trades down early in the morning. <sighs> Sorry. Early in the morning, it trades below Friday's low. Now, while we're here, another anomaly that we talked about earlier was poor highs and poor lows. And we said poor highs and poor lows are usually the, the result of liquidation or short covering versus new money buying. So this low on Friday afternoon more than likely was nothing more than some short covering late in the day on Friday and it goes right back up to the exact um, rally high from the afternoon. So one of the nuances we, we carry into yesterday morning is we had a poor low on Friday. The market comes down takes out that poor low yesterday morning. Now, one of the things that we talk about extensively uh, in, the, in, the, in the intensives, and we do intensive, we do about eight hours of live trading every week. And then, of course, we have a blog, a real-time blog that I post throughout the day. It's a one-way blog. But one of the things that we're always talking about is if a market comes down, and takes out a low. I will very seldom go short on the first time it takes out that low. What happens is everybody can figure out there's going to be stops there. So it's not uncommon if the market is just gunning for those stops for the market to go down, take out those stops, and how does a trader profit? How do short-term traders, if they're forcing the market down to take a stop out, they're selling. Once the market goes through the point where the stops are, you get some acceleration to the downside, and the traders that forced the market down there to take out the stops, they now bid or they buy. They were short, they were shorting in order to push the market down through the stop. Once they get the stops, it triggers other stops. They use that momentum to buy back their shorts. That's how they profit. That's the sh very short-term game that goes on in the market all the time. Now, so many times, if I want to go short for real, I wait to see the second time. Because if we, if we break below, come back in, and then go down a second time, that is generally more serious type of selling going on in the marketplace. Again, that is another nuance. You know, so I look for the second time to make sure that it's more serious. Okay. Now, the market went down again in B period, and it took out it took out uh, the early period low, and it came back in to the Friday's range a second time. We have generally not talked in terms of market setups. And the reason we haven't talked in terms of market setups is most times when people talk about a market setup, they are talking about an absolute price. And we're now going to introduce the term into our lexicon a little bit of market setup. But we're going to do it in a, with talking about levels uh, combined with a logical place to put a stop. So it will be a potential trade entry level as well as a stop to accompany it, in this case. Um, 
but it's uh, uh, not exact pricing. So now let's talk about a classical setup that I like. We came down in the second period, in B period, down below E period, and we re-entered yesterday's range a second time. Very often, that is a classic trade that I like to do, or if you would prefer to call it a setup. At that point in time, uh, I will normally put my stop. Uh, in this case, I would probably put my stop just uh, uh, one or two ticks above the low for the day, or if you choose, make it a little wider, put it a couple of ticks below the low for the day. Basically, if this is any good, it shouldn't take out that particular, shouldn't take out that low. So yesterday morning was a classical, what I call a setup. We looked below Friday's range once. We looked below Friday's uh, range twice. We looked below the early April. We came back in. To me, that's a classical buy with a stop down around the uh, um, down around the previous the previous low, or the over in here. Now, what you'll see is the market then rallies all the way back up to the just a single tick, I'm sorry, just a couple of ticks below the opening for the day. The opening for the day is a classic day time frame reference. Opening for the day, um, the open, half back, overnight high and low, they are classic references that we use to monitor what is going on in the day time frame. So as you see, as the market rallied back up in C period, in C period right here, it did not take the opening, it did not take out the overnight high, and at this point in time, when it gets up near the upper end of the range as a short-term trader, that is a classical place that I will exit the trade. You might say, well, won't, shouldn't you maybe give it a little more time? If I'm doing a short-term day trade, the reason I don't give it a lot more time is that I got what I wanted. If there's going to be a problem, it is more than likely going to occur someplace around the early morning high or opening. So I'm very happy not to be greeting, just to step aside. And I also knew that it wasn't a high confidence market to begin with yesterday. All right, so now the market then breaks back down. Market breaks back down and fails one more time to take out the early morning low. Now we're going to switch topics here for just a second. We talked earlier about having one big idea. The one big idea or the biggest idea we deal with is the idea of value. We trade value, not price. Price is a mechanism for advertising opportunity. Time regulates all opportunities. And volume measures the success or failure of the advertised opportunities. But remember, the most important thing is that price is an advertising mechanism. Some, some advertised opportunities are accepted. Some are rejected. When I looked at yesterday morning, the blue, the lighter blue shade from Friday, represents. This is this is actually Monday. So the lighter blue shade from Friday represented Friday's value area. The low of Friday's value area is right here. Now, yesterday, this was the final value area for yesterday. But look early on. Early on. The value area is just the low of the value area is just slightly below the low of the value area for Friday. The value area represents the area where approximately two thirds of a day of the daily trade takes place. So it's the center of a distribution curve, if you would. So now, by the time I get into B period, C period, and even down here in F period, it is very unlikely that I'm going to get anything other than overlapping to lower value 
yesterday. Overlapping to lower value tells me that more than likely I'm going to have a rotational day. Not a trend day, but more than likely I'm going to have a rotational day. The market tried to go out of balance to the downside and it really didn't do a very good job of it. Some of the biggest opportunities are when a market tries to go out of balance and comes back in, which is what happened yesterday. But the big clue was by, by the second or third period, I was pretty comfortable that value was going to be overlapping to lower yesterday. Overlapping to lower tells me that more than likely I am dealing with a rotational day. On a rotational day, my opportunities are going to be smaller. So I want to buy breaks. I want to take profits on rallies. And so I have, I have a framework for conducting my short-term trades on that particular day. And that worked very, very well yesterday. Now, well, I want to go back. Let's, first of all, let's just review some things very quickly. We've covered a lot of information very quickly. We covered the rally high from Friday as a nuance, and we said more than likely there will be stops there. We then said the overnight high was one tick above the rally high, probably increases the stops. The early morning high was exactly at the unchanged level. That tells me there's going to be more stops, but it also tells me something more important. Who, who is selling at that level? It is highly unlikely that longer term, more serious money is waiting to sell exactly at a reference such as that. I've told folks before that I used to run an institutional trading desk for um, uh, UBS Financial Services. And, you know, when we had institutional orders, you're never waiting for an exact price. You, you would have your lunch handed to you if you tried to be that exacting when you're talking about large size. Okay, so we've got some pretty good information. We've got a pretty good idea that it's shorter term traders uh, day and short-term traders in charge of the market. We think there's pretty good um, stops up here. And if this is exact, that exacting for the find the sellers, more than likely we're not going to have high odds of a lot of downside continuation. We may get it, but the odds are low. Then we came down and we talked about taking out Friday's low, talked about the first time may well be the game to get the stops. Second time more serious, but then we talked about the second time you come back into the previous day's range, that may be a, a setup or a pretty good place to go long the market and put your stop someplace at the uh, just a tick or so below the low for the day or a couple ticks below it. We then saw the market rally back up. I said that's a great place to get out because if there's going to be a problem on a rotational day, that's probably where it's going to be. Now. We come back down late yesterday afternoon, you get I period back down near the low for the day. And J period cannot take it out. Following J period, what happens? The market rallies back up a fast rally in J period, K period comes up and guess what it does. Remember these, these stops we were talking about? I saw them on Friday. So I'm over the weekend. Uh, I have a friend in Romania. I sent him an IM yesterday morning. I said, "Be careful! Be careful of the game playing of the stops from the uh, from the rally high on Friday afternoon. Late in the afternoon, nothing else going on. Guess what? The game was on full tilt. They came back up, and all all they did, they went back up. They got these highs." And that, that was all. It was game over, side out. That's all they were trying to do, get up, get the high out from the, pull, the rally high on Friday, the overnight high, the early morning high. What's up there? Stops. Once they get the stops, what do they do? We, we, that's the reason I said I always wait twice. First time up, they get the stops. How do you profit from getting the stops? If you're part of the people leading the game, you bid the market up to take out the stops. Once you get the stops, that triggers more buy. You turn around. You sell into it. That was the game. That was the game for yesterday. Um, so that's, that's an example. It's a long way to go through this. But it is an example of the importance of nuances 
when you are trying to be a successful day and short term trader. Julia used a wonderful word last night. We were talking about this, and she was talking about you know the mental integration that has to go on because you're taking you're constantly taking in a lot of different information. This is why it takes so long to become a successful professional trader. It's constant information and constant integration of a lot of information. We do the intensive, and it was Julia's idea to do the intensive, so that you have a better chance to understand how this integration works. If we go out and we do a three-day or a five-day seminar in a, in a hotel room, you know, you may think it was great, but you may not see as many things as we see over a 30, or it's this case, it's about a five-week intensive. You see a lot more uh, examples of what goes on in markets and nuances, etc. It also gives you more time to begin to internalize these important concepts into your daily trading. It doesn't come easy. Tremendous amount of information going on. Julia, let me stop right here and take only questions relative to what we have talked about to this point. Okay, great. Thank you, Jim. And one comment, too, is that push down in the morning uh, off the open, that was really an overnight inventory adjustment. So if you were cognizant of the overnight trade um, I no, guess really, it was pretty short. I'm I'm thinking about today's market. No, no, yesterday's yesterday's market was the trickiest the trickiest market we have seen. If you looked at it mechanically, since most of the overnight trade from Sunday took place, since most of the overnight trade from Sunday took place below the settle, we would think that the overnight inventory was short. The truth of the matter is I did not call overnight inventory short yesterday and the reason being that we traded down here early on Sunday night and then it spent the rest of the night trading higher. Um, okay. I called uh, overnight inventory neutral coming into yesterday. Um, more than likely it actually was long because the majority of buying took place um, early in the session. but. Uh, I called it neutral at best. So I think, I think the reaction yesterday was more than likely off of the rally high, which was a very visible reference. Short-term traders like very visual references. They're familiar with it. Uh, it worked for four periods. Every time they sold there on Friday afternoon for four separate periods, the market traded lower. Short-term traders do what works until it doesn't work anymore. If it worked once, they'll do it twice, three, four, and yesterday was probably the fourth time, and they did it again. And if they got out quick enough, it worked. Okay, uh, questions related to what we have talked about so far. Yes, thank you, Jim. Would Jim say there, um, that he would have expected more elongation than we got in yesterday's K period? It seemed to quickly get back under Friday's rally high. No, I would not have. No, that's a great question a great question and no I would not expected more and the reason for that is because of how fat the profile was down here you're one two three four five six seven eight nine ten wide and I think there's only 13 periods in the day for the S&P so as of the, K it was probably 11 periods so yeah. you know it was almost every period up to J and then K okay. spikes higher I know you shorted up there so you were feeling it but the the uh, the wider well that's another potential setup we talked about a setup on the bottom uh, another potential setup here is once it comes back into the morning range once it comes back into the morning range it's another short if you want to do it and your stop's going to be right up in here someplace it's a very it's a very tight stop but you don't want to short it until it comes back into the range you want it to come back in to the uh, into the range, early morning range. But no, I would not have expected more elongation because of how fat it was with the point of control. Remember, another word for point of control is the fairest price at which business is being conducted. So this is the fairest price at which business can be conducted, being conducted right around the 1975 level. And that means that that buying that took place up here, people were buying above value. 
So no, I, I thought the odds were very good that we would uh, retreat back into the body of the profile based upon the POC or Ferris price at which business was being conducted. And that is the reason that I went to the short side of the market. Had the profile been elongated coming into that breakout, no, then I would have looked at any pullback as probably a buying opportunity. Good right. question. Thank you very much. Thank Another you, Jim. On what we've talked about. Would Jim say they were both, there were stops both above and below Friday's rally highs, um, even, and that's why a push down in the morning and later K period push up? Absolutely. Wonderful observation. Absolutely. It's a, it's a great observation, and those are the things that you're always looking for because then you get a better idea of what's really going on. Oh, they just got the stops, and after that there wasn't much more. Um, okay, and um, what should be the strategy for a day like this? Why did the market rally after 2 p.m.? And maybe he missed that comment, but basically Jim was saying that it was really light, or at least it was just a rotational day, which is what we would expect with overlapping to lower value. And uh, later in the day, they saw the stops up there, and they knew they could get away with it. It was a rotational day, and they gunned for them, and that was the reason. Go ahead, Absolutely. Jim. The late, the late rally was a game. That was, the, that was the whole point of what I was trying to make early on. It's a game. And when you understand that there is that gamesmanship that goes on in the market, and, it, and there's more gamesmanship when there is an absence of longer-term players, the less number of serious money in the market, the easier it is to play these games. And that's all you had yesterday. It was a game. Like I said, I could figure out the stops were there on Friday. I could figure out they were increased there when the overnight high. I could figure out they were increased there um, when you look at the early morning high was there. And, you know, I'm not a super duper trader. I mean, I'm, I'm not big size like some of these guys. I've been around for years. They can figure that's out where the stops are. And, and that's, that's an age old game. Gunning for the stops is an age old game in the market. And that's all I think that went place. And I think that's why the market rallied. And you can see the game because it came out of here like a shot. Mm -hmm. It just it just came out of here like a bullet. And you say, here they go. Okay, yeah. another question before we go on. With regards to entry at reference levels, would Jim usually wait for the second retest of the level before entering? Well, let me, I, I'm not sure. Yesterday I said when the market... If I'm looking at something like a low, look below Friday's low, first time it comes back in, I don't pay a lot of attention to it, I'll watch it. It's the, when it looked below it a second time and came back in, that is the trade that I have preferred, that I prefer, and anybody that's ever been in a webinar or, or a, a real-time seminar I've done knows that, and so that's what I'm looking for. So basically, it's just the opposite. It was a second test that there was nothing to the downside versus uh, a test is something to the upside. So I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but I, I'm, you know, and there's no absolute answer to any of these questions. You know, the first time, if it, if it would have gone down the first time and come up faster, uh, you know, and shown a little more confidence, that might have been the only time. But yesterday was, was a little different. It just, it was, it was indecisive down there, and there was still a lot of trading. In fact, even after I did the buy, I wasn't sure I was right, because it did look, it did look down near the lower, uh, lower end the third time, which made me question. I was glad I had to stop it. Okay, one more question before I go on. Does this game for going for the stops happen in all assets, commodities like cattle, for instance? Absolutely. People, people are people. Traders are traders. Anytime I used to, I used to work for uh, uh, a guy by the name of Tom Dittmer years ago. I wouldn't work for him, but. I had, a, I had a small business that was in partnership with Tom. I owned 51%, and I think Tommy owned less than that. But at that time, you know, I got very familiar with what they did, and uh, Refco, of course, is no longer around, but his company was Refco. And that stuff went on all, went all the time. Traders are traders. The mentality is exactly the same. Shorter-term traders, they're, only, they're opportunistic. They're looking for an opportunity. And the big thing is, we like we say, we do the intensive to help you get an understanding of the market. And you understand it best by appreciating the behavior and the way people that you are competing against act every day. 
we're going to see that again. We're going to see that behavior when we go real time for today. All right, I'm going to go on to okay. the next slide. Thank you. Okay, here's um, the structure, and we're just showing there's a selling tail. Um, the POC um, or Ferris Price Green Line, also an anomaly in, in this price, so it's right down here. Uh, we're looking at the value area. Anomalies are the jagged edges. Down here, we're looking at Friday was a poor, a poor low. These are all, these are all references that we look at throughout the day that help us make decisions. So we have a, here we have a selling tail. Here we have no buying tail. That so we look at the the uh, the point of control. It's the point of control is right here. We look to see how much that point of control changes or doesn't change as the day goes on. Very important. Half back. Half back, you'll see, when we go real time, you'll see this today, half back is a very important day time frame, short term traders left reference. And of course, the light blue shaded area is value. We always want to know where value is developing. Again, I'll show you in a few minutes. I was short this morning and uh, I covered my short because value was clearly going to be higher. First I was long, market rallied, came back into yesterday's range a second time, I got short, and then Julie and I were on the phone, I said, wait a minute, value's not going to be lower. We'll see that, we'll see that when we go to the profile. Value is the big idea that we're talking about. Anomalies, there's a lot of information in anomalies. When I see a market going up or going down, leaving anomalies, that's a market that's trading very emotional, uh, on a very emotional uh, inside people's head. And when that happens, that's usually short covering or long liquidation. And of course, uh, the top we had selling tail, the bottom we had a poor low we had on Friday. Uh, a lot of times, poor lows happen because the market, in this case, gets too short. Sometimes inventory gets too short. When it gets too short, sometimes the market has to rally before it can break. Okay, those were just some of the some of the kind of uh, structural things we'll see within a within a uh, a daily profile. Okay, we're going to we're going to go uh, look at today's profiles real time in a second in a few minutes here. But you'll see these are some of the early uh, early anomalies that we're developing uh, today, and we'll see how they may be important going forward. Now. Another very big um, nuance. Those of you that have been with us before know that the all-time high for the current long-term rally occurred at 202.75, a price of 202.75, oh, oh, 202.75 in the electronic market. The pitch session high occurred at 201.75. Neither of those are considered good highs. It's very rare that a long-term auction high ends in the electronic market. It's even rare that the all-time market high is a poor high, meaning no excess on the high. When we have no excess on the high, Selling that takes place from there is generally the result of short-term, day and short-term liquidation versus longer-term selling. Very, very important concept to keep, keep place. When you get liquidation, sometimes the market has to break before it can rally. You need to get some of the weaker hands out. So coming into today, we have a poor high at the all-time pit session high. We have another poor high uh, two days later, and before today happened, we had another poor high um, on the what would actually be the 11th, and then of course this I believe um, well we'll see when we go to well another poor high up here, but we'll see we'll see this in real time in just a minute. The important thing to know is that poor highs are definitely classified as a nuance. They, they deliver a tremendous amount of information. The information they deliver, as I see it, is generally that the selling 
was liquidation from up there versus a far more potent combination of new money selling and liquidation. Okay. Now I'm going to go over. I'm going to escape from here for now. I'm going to go over and take a look at today's market. So let's go back. Before we do that, let's look at this all together, and I can make this a little bigger, and we can just move it around. There's the poor high at the all-time high in the pip session. Another poor high. Another poor high down here. So coming into today, we had three poor highs. The odds of that occurring are very low. Uh, we had one in one of the intensives, and sure enough, it came and got it. But usually that's a sign that we're coming back to that level. It's a sign that the selling is short-term selling versus a more potent combination of new money selling uh, going on. Now, so we had one, two, I guess it was four. Now this one's corrected right here. One, two, three existing poor highs coming into this morning. Now, I'm going to mark another level here for you. Nineteen seventy five. I'm going to take a step aside for a minute. I'm going to go to a bar chart. And on that bar chart, I'm going to show the December S&Ps on a weekly basis. One of the most important things we, we constantly do is talk about the importance of preparation for any trader. So many times the trade that you benefits you today or the trade you identify today was something that was setting up yesterday or maybe even several days prior. For example, the poor highs that we just looked at before we came to the bar chart, those have been setting up for some time. That's information we have been carrying forward. And it's information that if all of a sudden if the market comes to life, then we have to bring those front and center and say the market may be uh, aiming for those poor highs. Now, the number, um, hold on, just make, let me sh make sure. Okay. What I just did, I had the wrong chart up, what I just did is when the roll takes place in the market, I then go and use only the December contract. So in the S&Ps, I use only the December contract. Uh, I don't use the continuous contract. I want to see exactly where trade is taking place. The high of this lower distribution, this was a lower trading range, the high of this number is um, Julia, why am I getting, I thought the number was 75, or did it change? Am I? It's saying SEP for some reason on your front month oh, adjusted. I Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. I knew something wasn't right. <laughs> okay. The high of this distribution using SEP is 1975. Using DEES. Use, using DEES, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm going to do this. I'm going to use Snagit for a second because it allows me to capture this distribution, color it, and make it a little easier on the imagination. So I've got that as the lower distribution. And then I see 
the upper distribution right here. Now the upper distribution is starting to overlap the lower distribution, which tells me that the market's getting very tired. However, in what I wrote, we do a, uh, we do a letter at night called a recap uh, and preparation report for the following day, and we do an update in the morning. The number, the important number that we have been using recently is 1975, and I wrote 1975, I believe, last night, I said, because that is the level that bifurcates or divides the lower and upper distribution. And what I wrote is, if we get acceptance down below, more acceptance down below 1975, we start shooting for this gap down here. If we fail to get that acceptance, then the market starts to target the all-time high. So that was the magical number we were using. It's, it's been a little fluffy because it's been back and forth through this. But notice, it closed above it on Friday. It closed above it again yesterday. We have never had a close down below the 1975 level. Not that I am doing, not that I do a lot with closes. But I do recognize we've never closed down below that important reference in 1975. So what did the market do today? It took off. It could not stay again down below 1975, and the market rallied from that uh, from that level. So I wanted you to have I wanted you to have this picture in uh, this picture in mind. So now let's go back. Remember. We came in and we had one, two, three poor highs coming into today. And the caution has been those poor highs are very likely an indication of a market that is too short. By too short, that means that you've had liquidation taking place by the trading community, probably day and short term, but you haven't been joined by the longer term money, and it's the longer term money that will, on the long run, determine where we go on the market. So short term traders have been selling this market, but they haven't been assisted and had any support from the longer time frame. So more than likely, the short term money, and short term, in, in my second book, uh, Markets and Market Profile, we describe the behavior of the time frames in the market in more detail. But basically, what we're talking about is the short-term time frame is actually a very important time frame. They have huge amounts of money, someplace, sometimes a, you know, $100 million, a billion dollars, uh, but they, they're not in the market for the long haul. They're in the market very opportunistic uh, trading back and forth, and they can wield some very large size. So that size, those short-term traders have been shorting this market not being getting any support from the longer term money as evidenced by the poor highs so what happens now you get down and one more time today uh, overnight in overnight inventory last night was 100 not quite we measure overnight inventory let me make this just a little larger we measure overnight inventory from the settle of the previous day and any trading that takes place below that would be considered short. Trading take above it would be considered long. It's as simple as that. And generally, the trading, the trading money overnight is generally weaker money than the tr money you see trade throughout the day. And as we said earlier, Julia has kept track of this. And about 65% of the time, there is a counter action to overnight inventory. This morning, other than a few ticks, the market was almost 100% short overnight inventory market rally did not take out the overnight low and remember the overnight high and low are always extremely important day time frame trading references again and this is also listed under overnight inventory overnight high and low also listed under anomalies because it's amazing how many traders even traders that have been around sometimes are not aware of those references and their importance. So again, it's more, more nuances. And once you get to be a serious trader, or you're trying to bring into the big time ranks, 
anomalies are what's going to make the difference between you and everybody else that you're competing against. So the market, we came in this morning, overnight inventory was 100% short. When it fails to take the overnight low, uh, the destination trade or the target becomes the overnight high. Um, and of course, once you're off and running this morning, it, the tricky part this morning, this is the one that almost caught me. The market went up, A period tagged or was one tick short of yesterday's high. I knew the chances of that being good for the day were pretty slim. The market came back down, B period took out the high, and of course you've got the next shot to the upside. B period came back in to yesterday's range, as did C period. When C period came back into yesterday's range, one of the setups that I use, if, if we're going to use that term, I got short at, I believe it was 79, 75 or someplace in there. Then the market came back, so it was back in. I waited till it was back in twice, sold the first little bounce, and then the market started down, and I was feeling pretty good about the trade. And Julia and I were on the trade, on the phone, right here. Now, what's going to be important, it doesn't show right now, because too much has taken place, but let me mark 1976-25, at the time D period came down, well this was half back, D period came to a single tick above half back. Now, let's go on to another potential setup or nuance that takes place. Balance, the two most important concepts that we ever deal with are balance and excess. Whether it be 10 months of balance, 5 days of balance, or two 30-minute periods. So B and C period, B and C period were two balanced periods. The lows were exactly the same. When the market looked below the BC uh, low, that is a market, and we have rules for trading balance. The rules for trading balance are, one, remain in balance, two, look below balance and get rejected, three, look below balance and accelerate lower. If you look below balance and get rejected, the destination trade becomes the opposite extreme. So once we got rejected above the BC range, when D period came back in, the next upside objective was the early B period high up here. So this was the trade, the breakout to the, to the downside. And so I was talking to Julia. I, we were talking about actually preparing the slides for today. And uh, I, was getting, I was getting very uncomfortable. And I wasn't very communicated with Julia. And she was getting, I think, a little bit ready to stomp on my head, and I just said, I've got to change my position, can I, uh, can I call you back? And what I was reflecting on, there was no downside follow here, follow through here. Now, with no downside follow here, follow through here, and this is the first place there's acceptance today, here is yesterday's value area. One more time, unless I am going to be able to find acceptance down here in continuation, I am going to have overlapping to higher value today. So that was what was catching my attention. Several things. One, I was short and feeling pretty complacent because uh, it came back in as a classic trade I like. Then I got uncomfortable and it was hard to take this out. Finally took it out and there was no real push to it. It's, it's faded, stopped one tick short of half back. I know that's dangerous. Once it came back into this range, I've got to be out of that short because now the destination trade is the opposite end. What was also going through my mind was value. Value, this was yesterday's value. At this point in time, this was probably the lowest I would see for value today, so the odds were very good. Value was going to be at least overlapping to higher today. If you are going to ever be short, or, I'm sorry, if you are going to fade value, 
One of the rules is you have to be right very quickly. So when I faded, uh, when I faded uh, the market today, when it came back into yesterday's range a separate, separate time, I still, every time you put a trade on, you monitor for continuation. So and that's all, you, you always have to have some idea of if I'm in a trade, what do I need to remain in that trade? What would my plan look like? Well, if I'm going to be short and remain in this trade, I need to start to get elongation to the downside. At a minimum, I've got to see that value is going to be unchanged before the day is over. And when I get down here, and I'm not going to get any downside follow through here, chances are value is going to be overlapping to higher at a minimum. I have got to get out of that short immediately. And very lucky that uh, I actually did it in two steps. First, I adjusted it because I was nervous. Then I just hit market and uh, got out of the trade. So that's, again, how we use this information. But also, I was carrying forward these poor lows. Now, let's see what happened. The market came back up. I'm sorry, poor highs. The market came back up. It only took out one of these poor highs. We've still got this poor high, this poor high, as well as the overnight high. And guess what? We added to it again today. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is talk about tomorrow or the possibility for tomorrow after the FOMC meeting. But before I go into tomorrow, Julia, if you would give me questions that pertain to anything we have covered so far today. Yes, thank you, Jim. The profile was four wide in A, B, C, D periods this morning. An A period tail was too long, which prevented me from taking the longs today. Was my thinking wrong, and is there any context that I missed? No, you didn't. Um, can you show no, it, Jim, I, excuse me, on the lower part of the profile, just so people can see what Ragu is referring to? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I understand exactly what you're talking about, because it's four wide down here, and we've got all these single prints, all these single prints, and a lot of times we see this is too many, too far, too fast. And initially, that certainly had my attention. When we came back in and couldn't hold it, the real trade, the real long is right here. When you come back into the BC period and your stop's right down here. Remember what we said about the, the balance. balance. Balance and excess are the two most important concepts that we deal with. When it comes back into this balance, it's an asymmetric opportunity because when you come back in here, you can put your stop very tightly down here because you should not come back down here. So, and C period, pardon me, sir, was an inside bar. So we saw the extension on both sides of it. When it came back into that, quote, balance in a very short-term perspective with the inside bar in C, that was one place to, put, yeah. to get the long on. Just wanted to is, mention that. Go this ahead. This is another place when it broke out to the upside. But the big trade was here. But if in fact, if in fact you were carrying other information that we've talked about. We talked about 1975 level. There's 1975. That's why I went to the bar chart to show you these two distributions and the importance of this level. That's what, what, what happened, you were looking too short term today, you were looking just at the day time frame, and the longer time frame will always trump the shorter or day time, the short term or day time frame. And the longer or the bigger issue was the 1975 level. The other issue were these poor lows along the way. I understood exactly, I understand exactly what happened to you yesterday, uh, very understandable. Um, but it was really probably not having 1975 properly marked on your uh, chart and not taking an automatic short-term long when we looked below this two-period balance and came back in. That's the mechanical trade or the term. We historically have not used the word setup. Uh, Julie and I decided yesterday we will use it in a little different manner than some people because we'll use it as levels. But a setup means we have to have a reason to buy and a place to put a stop. If we don't have both, it is not a valid setup. When this re-enters this range, it is a valid buy level, and the placing a stop right here is a valid uh, structural stop. We base the stop based on structure. 
uh, not based on price. So it qualified as a setup. And then, of course, the short covering related to all these poor highs was underway. The market had gotten too short. Um, so anyhow, I understand. I understand what happened to you. I understand it 100 percent. Very understandable. But it's just looking one step beyond and probably carrying important information forward. The mechanical trade, the mechanical trade that would have saved you, was doing this buy as it came back in to the balance period. But it, it's a good question. Very, very much appreciated. Another question before we go to tomorrow, Julia. Yes, thank you, sir. In your opinion, was today's trade controlled by the short-term traders? In my opinion, today's trade was not controlled. By, well, it was controlled by the short-term traders, but they were caught short. They were caught short, and they were covering all day. This is why I went into all the explanation earlier on to talk about those poor lows, or poor, I'm sorry, poor highs. And what causes those poor highs? I said it's short-term traders, short-term traders selling the market. And remember, we, and I continued to stress, they never got any help from the longer-term um, market. If they had any help from the longer-term market, we wouldn't have these multiple poor highs. So there was no long-term, low long-term selling. You had the short-term sellers, and the short-term sellers got themselves caught very short in the very short in the hole. So yes, today was controlled by the short-term traders, but it was the short-term traders caught short. Now let me explain another game that goes on: is once the short covering rally is is underway, those short-term traders that were not caught short, that understand what is happening. They come in and bid the market. Even if they didn't want to buy the market, they come in and continue to bid the market because they know they've got these short traps. What you saw so many times during the day time frame, we see the day time frame traders get caught short, long and short and inventory adjustment. This was a more substantive uh, short covering rally because the short-term traders, who are generally a little smarter, got themselves caught. And then other short-term traders kept bidding the market to keep the pressure on them all day long. Okay. So, but that's, that's the issue, uh, the question. Yes, it was controlled by short-term traders, but it was short-term traders covering shorts and other short-term traders really pressuring those that were caught short. Okay, Jim, this is fabulous. And we want to get to your analysis for the FOMC announcement tomorrow. But a couple of quick questions, can we, sir? Take sure, absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, Two things. Wasn't it a high confidence open? Wouldn't that mean to lay off the short trade? And uh, secondly, the overlapping to higher value, would that not mean a rotational day? And it's great that he brings this up because it's not overlapping to higher value. It's it's clearly higher value. So we do have a different scenario than Monday's oh, trade. So I I'm think sorry. I was looking at this value earlier. Here's, yes, here's the high of yesterday's value area. The, the, I'm very sorry, I misled you. The, the break down here to the half back was exactly to the top of yesterday's value. Area. So value wasn't going to be overlapping to higher today. It was going to be clearly higher. Okay, great. Thank you, Jim. And um, the other question, but isn't a poor high, in that I believe he's con talking about today, isn't that an indication of the market being too long, not too short? Why are you saying that the market is too short and that was short covering all day by the short-term traders. And I think that it's a process. The poor high is one data point, but when you think about it, the overnight trade was short, yesterday was short, um, and uh, the early morning, you know, push up once it started, they were caught. Even in that rotational four wide area early in the session, you know, many traders were selling it there, and they got that little blip down in D period, thought they had something, pulled in a few more, and then they pulled the chute on the other side, and they really squeezed them. Is that okay. correct, sir, or am I a little it off is, there? It is, but let's, but let's go back to the original question. The original question was, um, the poor high, can, cannot that be an indication of a market that is too long? Absolutely, and we have said that. And that's one of the things in the second edition of Mind Over Markets that I expand upon. So early on, the first poor high was up here at uh, the all-time pit session high. And that poor high 
more than likely was an indication of a market that was too long. And many times when the market gets too long, it then has to break before it can rally. Now, remember, that's one data point. The other thing we've said, if you have one poor high, then two poor highs, and then three poor highs, all of a sudden it becomes exponential that we're going back in that direction. So I think your question's a great question, and I think what happened is the market started out, the initial liquidation break began because day and short-term inventory got too long. So I think you're absolutely right there. But then, as the momentum, momentum traders started to see all oh, the markets going down, then when they jumped on and they started mechanically selling every little rally, and every little high, then the market went from too long to too short. As Julia used the word process before, that's exactly the process that takes place. First you start, that's how inventory goes from too long to too short. You started off too long, then the liquidation came in, pl in place, and then people said, oh, the market's going down, and the market, sh the market one time frame lower, meaning this high did not take out this high, 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 and it, you only had on uh, last week you had one day when the market didn't one time frame lower, then the market reverted again to one time framing lower, so you had this thing set up where it's, I believe it started off because it was too long, then traders got this idea in, the th in, their, in their head, that the market was going lower, and they just started to sell it. And they went from too long to just the opposite of that, which, is too, which was too short. That's what I believe the process is and what happens. And that's a very normal type of things that happens to traders. They go from one extreme to the other. More often, we see it happen on the day time frame. This time, we saw it happen with the short-term time frame, which makes the potential for some of these moves more dramatic. But it's a good question. It's a complicated question. But again, it's one of these things that you start to get a better handle of understanding that process by working with the markets for an extended period of time. And again, it's one of those things when we do the intensive that we allowed to talk about these things over and over again. They don't come easily. And your question was great. You said, well, Jim, in one case you said it meant this. In another case, she said it meant this, and that's exactly that is exactly what happens as we go through the process. Okay, one final question, and then I want to go to tomorrow. Julia, you there? Yes, thank you. I thought A, B, C, and even D periods were developing a short covering P formation. Were there any clues that the market would go even higher, other than? the E period breaking out of the D period range. Well, yeah, they, they were they were developing a kind of a P formation, but a P formation, a P formation is an indication of short covering. But a P formation, by no stretch of the imagination, means that the short covering is over. Good successful trading has an awful lot to do with your ability to imagine a trade and imagine what is going on in the market. Looking at this too short time, too short time frame, you see the P, but that doesn't mean it's over. The bigger picture was understanding poor high, poor high, poor high, that this thing had just built up to massive proportions and also understanding, remember, I went to the bar chart to show the 1975 level. The, sh the longer time frame is going to rule out over the longer, over the shorter time frame. Once we couldn't hold 1975, if you've been looking at the reports or if you get our reports, and anybody that signs up for the intensive, they get them as soon as they signed up, as well as access to you know our 50 to 100, whatever it is, um, past recorded webinars. But it's that kind of, the bigger picture, as I said, always trumps the shorter term. And the other thing is, another rule that we talk about, another important consideration, is the market always has to take care of current business first. That's the importance of carrying forward these poor highs, to know that the market is very short in the short time frame. The current business was to take care of all of those shorts. Okay, let me, let me go forward and talk about
tomorrow. All right. Now, we coming into tomorrow to the FOMC meeting, we are no better off than we were coming into today when we're talking about the number of poor highs. We have a poor high at the all-time high. We have another poor high uh, two days later. We, have, we corrected this poor high, but we came and we left another poor high today. So again, remember this market's been down since the all-time high, and what are we? We're uh, from today's high, six or seven handles off of the all-time high. There's been no real selling in this market. The longer time frame has not decided to show their hand and liquidate or sell anything that we can see at this point in time. Now, so coming into tomorrow, remember we said if we get above, the, stay above the 1975 level, which we did, the destination trade becomes the upper extreme, which would mean the all-time high at the 201.75 level, and then the 202.75, which was made um, in the overnight market. So now, coming in tomorrow, I have no conviction that uh, we have any good, any, any completion on the high. The rally today was on 3.1 billion, so there, it was less than yesterday. So we had short, uh, short covering today. I don't see from the shape or from the, uh, the volume, I don't see any indication that I had any new money buying in here today. I just see that I had an indication that I had short covering. Now remember, this, this can get complicated again, short covering can weaken a market as it takes out, all those people are short, it takes out potential buying power. So now, again, we talked earlier about anomalies. Here is an anomaly right here, Julia had circled this earlier. We have an, another anomaly right here, and we had another anomaly right here, and we have a poor high as an anomaly. So again, we have nothing substantial to really talk about going higher tomorrow. The market looked weak on the downside, a weak, weak on the rally today, but yet we have all these poor highs. Again, I would hate to have to bet my life on which way the market goes tomorrow. What is most important to me tomorrow with the FOMC announcement with the Federal, Federal Reserve's chairman's conference, press conference, a half an hour later, is what we identify as sequencing. And by sequencing, so let's talk about the most bullish scenario tomorrow. The market, the, the announcement comes out, the market breaks initially down into here someplace, and then without taking, without having taken out today's high first. It breaks down here first, then rallies back up towards the all-time high. That would be one sequence. Let's talk about another sequence. It rallies first, then comes back into today's range and heads down. That would be the bearish scenario. Rallies first, get rejected, come back in. I would think, there's what I'm trying to say, I would think there's very good odds that we are going to trade both sides of this late afternoon range and I'm just, well, let me, I'm sorry, let me change that. I'm going to take the afternoon, late afternoon range from uh, 1990.75 on to the high. I would think there's a very good chance that we trade both sides of that range tomorrow. Whether it happens before or after the announcement, I think sequencing is going to be important coming into tomorrow. I don't, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be locked into any one scenario tomorrow. We're going, if we go up first or down first, I, I think it's going to be important. Down first probably gives us a buying opportunity. Up first may give us a selling opportunity. But remember, we still have a lot of poor highs up there at the all-time high. This is not a high confidence market. Today's rally was not a high confidence rally in there. We've got the anomalies. They usually get revisited. doesn't have to be the next day. Volume was less than yesterday, 3.1. Profile was not elongated. It was too stretched out, short covering, no new buying coming in today, mostly short covering. Short covering can weaken a market. 
I, I mean, that's not, it's certainly not, I haven't given you anything to take home and say, boy, I'm going to bank this one. But what I have given you is be prepared for the market to trade on both extremes of this late afternoon range tomorrow. And I think what may be the most important is which side we trade first, what we call sequencing. What happens first in the sequence? Jim, could um, you make your profile just a little bit bigger, just so people can see we have a double distribution in the single prints. And, I mean, anyone who sees your reports daily is going to say, you know, treat them as separate days, so we'll take the upper distribution as a, fir a starting point, and where do we trade from there in terms of value and that sort of thing, correct? Well, the first, yeah, well, there's several things here. And let me go back to... Um, I'm going to go back and do another snag it on here. Um, Maybe hold, show the whole day, though. Um, I, I, I want, but first thing I want to show, first one I want to show is right here. We had a four-day, um, I, I should have used the white chart, of a four-day trading range. Um, You can probably see it on the bar chart too, the daily bar. Okay, there's my four-day trading range. This is the high of the four-day trading range. And so the first thing I'm looking at, and I'm not thinking about the double distribution today. That's not what's coming to my mind. What's coming to my mind is the high of the four-day trading range. And that's basically where we were trading back into yesterday, this afternoon, late this afternoon. And we, you know, we, there's single prints, but we really only got a little ways back into this four-day range. This four-day range, which I'm going to call basically the 1999, the 19, what's the low of that? Call it about 1990. I'm going to call that it's the support area in here. If there's anything meaningful on the downside, I probably get accepted back, well back down below this four-day trading range. Uh, so that would be the first thing I'm looking for. If I stay above this four-day trading range, then more than likely I'm off to the all-time highs up here at the 201 area. So this is the most important thing I'd be looking at on a little longer time frame, you know, for a support area. And um, but then I'm also looking and say I've got a series of poor highs all the way through. But let's say I go up and correct those poor highs first, you know, and then come back in. Now you've got to be very careful on the downside, okay? But it's not the double distribution okay. I'm looking at. It's yep. the high of the prior four-day trading range. Okay, gotcha. And a poor high for today, another poor high. So we now yep. have four poor highs. That's right. Um, it, it's really not. Or three. We repaired it, September 10th. Yeah, we, that's correct. We have three. It really is the, the confidence in this market is very low in both directions. Now, had we had higher volume, had we had higher va volume today, it would have been more impressive. But 3.1 on this huge short covering rally tells me all I had was old business, which we classify as short covering, or long liquidation would be old business versus new business. And remember, the short covering actually weakens a market. So all these shorts that were in this market, a lot of those have had to cover. So I don't really, you know, I don't have any high confidence the only thing I, I think the highest odds are we trade both sides of this smaller range that we saw uh, today. Okay, let me go back to the slides and just kind of wind this up. Um, profile structure represents market-generated information. Market-generated information. Could you use the slideshow, Jim? Excuse me, it's just smaller for people from current slide. Market-generated information is the most reliable information you're going to get because it's the result of real orders placed in the market. It's real people doing real business. It is not related to the talking heads that you see on TV, and you can find any opinion you want. This is real money uh, in here. There are many other, you know, the nuances uh, are very powerful once you understand them. And, you know, 
they t the nuances help tell you which time frames are dominating in the market. You know, for example, when we have those poor highs, what did we say? The most important time frame in trading is the longer time frame. They determine where we're going over a longer period of time, and they have the staying power. We talked about who was dominating. We said those poor highs that we saw today, that told us that the market on the downside was not being dominated by the longer time frame. And I get continual questions, Jim, Jim, did you think you saw longer term selling in here? And I kept saying, no, I don't. Are you, are you sure? I said, no, I don't think I did. They said, well, how about last Friday when the market really went down? I said, no, I don't think I saw longer term time frame selling. As it turned out today, we didn't have that. Inventory conditions, we're always, we're always looking to see what do we think the inventory conditions are? Because that's related to the behavior of the people we compete against. So often we are talking about inventory on the day time frame basis. It gets long, it gets short. Yesterday's rotational day got too short, got too long, got too short, got too long. And goes back and forth. Today what we're talking about, we saw a short covering from the shorter term time frame. Shorter term time frame I may not have mentioned. It's usually three to five days, maybe up to nine days. Longer, they'll stay overnight. They're backed by an awful lot of money. They're very powerful in the market, particularly in short-term moves. But they got it all wrong, and they had to cover today. We're looking. Uh, another thing we talk about market-generated information is auction completion. What did I say? What is a poor high? A poor high represents an incomplete auction. It's like a baseball game that was postponed because of of darkness. And also, so much of what's going on in the market is understanding the emotional mindset of those that we are trading against as long as you know and the game plan it's just like those people that we where we showed example where they went after the shorts yesterday above the uh, Friday afternoon rally high what well, those traders were going after those stocks and they knew what that was going to do to the emotion of the people that were caught short they were playing on on those emotions okay We've got coming up here starting September 29th through October 31st, I think that's about five weeks. Uh, the intensive, it's eight hours per week. Usually we go over that. Uh, the interday chat dialogue where I make one-way chats throughout the day. Upon enrollment, you know you start to get the reports that we put out and um, you also gain access to over 100 trading uh, articles and over 50 webinars. Uh, I want to thank you. Julie and I both want to thank you very much for today, and we hope you join us in the intensive. And if you don't do that, we've got several more webinars that you're always welcome to join when we do public webinars. Once again, thank you all very, very much for attendance, and thank you for staying late. Okay, great. Thank you, Jim. That was fabulous. We appreciate you sharing, and thank you, everyone, for being here. We'll get this recording up and loaded to our site in about an hour's time. And uh, everyone, have a wonderful evening, or wherever you're at, have a great day. And uh, we'll see you in, on Thursday. We have another webinar, um, so check out our upcoming webinars. We have one for European traders, 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Time to accommodate uh, people on the other side of the pond. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. God bless you, and good night.